Good morning again and welcome. Uh, glad all of you are here joining us. Uh, happy to have you with us today. If you have a Bible at home, um, go ahead and grab it. It'd be nice to be able to follow this story along. We're going to be in the book of Daniel uh, today, chapter 2, and there's 49 verses, so we're not going to cover each one of those, but we're going to try to tell the whole story in, in the middle, and, and uh, we're on our second week in our series, There's Another in the Fire. just want to start with a question. Have you found yourself lying awake at night lately? Just lying awake thinking about stuff, maybe thinking about what the future is going to bring, maybe even worrying about the future, our future that just is so uncertain day after day these days. Just wonder if you've been experiencing that because I've been, the more and more I've talked to people, I've been hearing more and more um, that people are experiencing this. I've had a few nights like that myself. We're just lying awake and you're thinking about what's coming up. So let me ask you a question. When you do get up in the morning and have that morning coffee, what do you open first? Your Bible app or the daily briefing? And of those two things, which of those two things is going to bring you more peace? And, and why is that? Haven't we been feeding our fears a lot these days? Because that, that daily briefing, that, that news source, whatever it is that you check into or regularly read or hear or listen to throughout the day to bring you news, there's not a lot of rest that's going to be found in that daily briefing. There's not a lot of rest that's going to be found in the news. There, there is no good news on the news. And the more that we immerse ourselves with that, the, more, the, the less rest we're going to have, the less peace we're going to have in our souls. Why? Because we don't know what the future is going to bring. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And, and, and the, more we, the more we stay in that realm where we're uncertain of the future, the less peace and rest our heart's going to be at. That's the kind of thing that can keep us lying awake at night. But are you feeding your, your faith these days? Are you spending some time in the Word? Are you connecting to Jesus? Because that is the thing that's going to put our hearts at rest. Why? Because God shows us the future. God shows us how things are going to turn out. God puts his promises in front of us and shows us what we have to look forward to. God gives us the understanding we need, and that is what puts our hearts at peace and rest. That is the thing that takes away stuff like worry. And friends, whatever we feed grows. Whatever we feed grows. All right, if, if we're feeding, if we feed our faith, it grows. And along with it, understanding, and then peace, and then rest. But if we feed our fears, if we feed our fears, we're going to find ourselves lying awake at night, being unable to sleep. Now, in our, in our Bible story, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar found himself lying awake at night, being unable to sleep. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful king in the world. He was the king of Babylon. Babylon was the world power. They had just conquered Assyria and Egypt and now Judah. And these countries were paying tribute to them. Nebuchadnezzar was flying high. Everything was going his way. Everything was going right for King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful king in the world. So how is this man... Why is this man who rules the world restless? Why is he not sleeping at night? Nebuchadnezzar was actually a very religious man. At his coronation, which is just a little bit, of, uh, like a, a year ahead of this, his coronation, Nebuchadnezzar prays a prayer to the main Babylonian god Marduk. This prayer can be found, it's on an inscription, it's in a museum, a British museum. And in this prayer that, that, that Nebuchadnezzar prays on his coronation day, he definitely shows that he believes that there is a God who created him, who he owes everything to, who he wants to serve, who he fears, who he wants to please. 
And Nebuchadnezzar actually was named after the Babylonian god of wisdom, Nabu. So, but yet with all this religion in his life, he's actually living in the darkness of ignorance. See, Nebuchadnezzar didn't have the understanding that he truly needed. He didn't have a true, real peace about his future because his religion only brought fear into his life. His religion um, only made him more fearful. He feared losing his kingdom, losing his power, his control, his authority, his wealth, his, his legacy, his life, his future. He feared about his future. And so he has this dream that keeps him up at night, that, that leaves him troubled and, and restless because he fears that it deals with his future. So if you have your Bibles now, this is time to open them up to Daniel chapter 2. I'm just going to kind of tell the story of the first part um, till we get in the middle of it. So King, ne- King Nebuchadnezzar has this dream where um, that keeps him up at night, and so and he doesn't know what it is, doesn't know what it means, and so he calls in all of the uh, ma- magicians and, and astrologers and the wise men of Babylon, and he, he tells them, I want you to interpret this dream for me. And they said, okay, tell us what the dream is, and we'll interpret it. He's like, no, 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 no. You're not going to pull that one on me because then I, I don't believe anything you say because then I think you're just pulling my leg. You're going to tell me what the dream was and give me the interpretation. Otherwise, the gods aren't talking through you. And they're like, no one can do that. It's impossible. Only the gods can do that. And that made King Nebuchadnezzar furious because that proved to him that, that they weren't speaking uh, what the gods were sharing them, that they were only making stuff up to, to tell him what he wanted or, or to even mislead him. And so he ordered that they were to be executed, all the wise men in Babylon. But that included Daniel and his friends who were the slaves captured from Judah. They were also going to be put to death. So Daniel, in a moment of huge bravery and courage, approaches King Nebuchadnezzar and says, give me a chance to tell that dream. So the one who appears to have everything, the king, is the one who's troubled and not sleeping at night. But the one who who appears to have nothing, the conquered slave, Daniel, has understanding and peace. So we're going to pick up the story from verse 17. And... uh, See where it goes from there. So then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So Daniel just asked his friends to pray for him. I mean, this group of friends, this was his small group. This was his connect group. This was his spiritual family. And when he needed them, they were there for him to pray for him. This is important. This is why our connect groups are important. This is why it's important that we spend time with each other, even if it's only virtually right now, so that we can encourage each other and pray for each other. So important. Then, during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven, and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power, you have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. And so God reveals that mystery to Daniel. This is a gift from God, and Daniel praises him for it. Daniel calls him the revealer of mysteries. He says that light dwells in him. And God does the same thing today. God reveals his mysteries to us. God gives you and me light when we're in darkness. He does that in his word. So then the story goes on. Daniel goes into the king he, he, to, to tell him the dream. The, the king Nebuchadnezzar says, you can do this. You can interpret my dream for me. And Daniel says, no, not me, 
but there is a God. There is the God, the God of heaven and earth who knows all things. He is the one who can reveal this dream. In fact, he is the one who's giving you this dream, Nebuchadnezzar, and he knows the meaning of your dream. And Daniel says, God has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the days to come. He wants to tell Nebuchadnezzar the future. So Daniel, in his, in, in, in his book, Daniel writes this part in Aramaic. He writes this part in Aramaic so the whole world could hear this. The, the world at that time and place could hear and read this. God wanted an audience with the king, and God wanted an audience with the world. Why? So that he could tell them about Jesus. Because this dream, ultimately, is about Jesus. And so Jesus is where God's wisdom and God's understanding is revealed and made known. And so God revealed himself to Nebuchadnezzar in a dream. God reveals himself to us in a person, Jesus. And so Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar that God was speaking to him in a dream. We need to tell the world that God is speaking to them through Jesus. Because, friends, Jesus is the mediator between this world and heaven. Jesus is the one who came down and lived our life and and died in our place and rose again to make everything right between us and God. Jesus did that for us. That's why you're part of his family. You're part of his kingdom. Your sins are forgiven. Jesus did that for us. He's the good news. And so the world needs people who understands this and who can who can make this word known to the world around us. So wherever God has placed you, wherever God has put you, God has also given you a word. It's not in a dream, it's in, it's in the Bible. God has given you a word that you can share, that you can make known with the people who are around you. Because friends, the person who trusts in God fears no bad news and therefore can be at rest. We need that understanding. Not only do we need that understanding, we need to share that understanding with others. So let's, let's pick up our text again. We're gonna, I'm going to read from verse 31, and we're going we're gonna to actually hear about this dream. We're going to hear the dream um, explained and then interpreted. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest of and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw that the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united, but more, any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. 
This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. So in this dream, you have this enormous, dazzling statue symbolizing kingdoms coming in the future. The head of gold, that was Nebuchadnezzar and the kingdom of Babylon. The chest and arms of silver, that was the Medes and the Persians. The belly and thighs of bronze were the Greek kingdom that followed them. And the legs of iron were the kingdom of Rome, the strong kingdom of Rome. Then the feet that was iron mixed with clay that was all the divided kings that followed from there. But that rock, that rock, not made by human hands, comes and smashes these kingdoms and then grows and grows and grows until it fills the whole earth. So all of those nations, all of those nations have turned to dust, but the kingdom of rock will never be destroyed. So this dream was, was good news, not bad news for King Nebuchadnezzar. Because Daniel told him, this will happen after you. So this dream was meant to announce the good news of his own kingdom and the much greater news of God's coming kingdom. Well, let's talk about that rock. Let's talk about that rock. Because the Old Testament had been talking about a stone or a rock that was going to come out of the tribe of Jacob and save God's people. In Genesis, Israel was promised blessings because of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. And then the Psalms told us even more about this rock, this stone. It's in Psalm 118, it says, The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Isaiah told us even more about it. He will be a sanctuary, but also a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. So this dream in Daniel is not the first time that we heard about this stone. But it would be the last time that we heard about this stone until a few centuries later when a carpenter from Nazareth who was born in Bethlehem shows up in Israel. And he shows up during the time that Rome had an iron-like grip on Israel. He shows up during the time Rome is in charge. Rome, the kingdom of iron. Rome was that kingdom of iron. And that is when this guy shows up in Israel. And this preacher from Nazareth began proclaiming the kingdom of heaven is near. And then he began doing signs and wonders that could not be done by human hands. And he talked about how this kingdom isn't like earthly kingdoms, but this kingdom is within you. It's in your heart. And it shows itself in faith and love and service and sacrifice. And plenty of people rejected this stone just as was prophesied. And then so this preacher started pointing to all those prophecies about the stone in the Old Testament and applying them to himself. He quoted Psalm 118, Isaiah 8, Daniel 2, and then he said about this rock, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. And then he asked uh, one of his followers, who, who, do you, who do you believe that I am? And his follower said that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, the one promised to come. And then this preacher said about that confession of faith, he said, on this rock, in other words, on this truth about Jesus, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Friends, Jesus and his kingdom is the rock in this dream. His kingdom brings down all other earthly kingdoms by his cross and his empty tomb. All those other nations are long since been turned to dust, but Jesus' kingdom 
keeps going. It lives on. It continues to grow. All powers, depending on, on human strength, on, on human power, will be overturned. This kingdom, not made by human hands. This kingdom starts out small but keeps on growing. And speaking of things that start out small and keep on growing, yes, this kingdom is even more powerful than Corona. This kingdom will last long after any trouble, any hardship in this world. His kingdom lives and grows in the hearts of people. His kingdom is shown in, in faith and love and service and beauty and blessing. His kingdom, his rule in our hearts draws and pulls our hearts away from allegiances to other things. His rule, his kingdom in our hearts pulls us away from allegiance to sin to things that are dangerous for us. It pulls us away from our allegiance to, to worldly things. It pulls us away from our allegiance to, to worldly power and fame and wealth and control. It, it pulls our hearts away from allegiance, from, from fear and, and worry, from worrying about things. His kingdom, which is growing in our hearts, identifies us with him and his kingdom, which is going to last forever. And just like that dream said it would, his, his kingdom, Jesus' kingdom, grew and grew. When did it begin? It began, as the dream said, during that iron kingdom. It, it began during the kingdom of Rome, the rule of Rome, the iron kingdom. But by the end of the book of Acts, this kingdom had subjects in Rome. And then just a few hundred years later, the, the emperor of Rome, the ruler of that iron kingdom, began worshiping this stone, began worshiping this rock, began worshiping Jesus. He became a Christian. And so the kingdom of rock overcame and replaced and took over the kingdom of iron. It outlasted the Roman Empire and continues growing today. Friends, we are part of this kingdom, this, this rock in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. This is the kingdom we belong to. With, with, with the risen, victorious Jesus, we have a ruler who will never come off of that throne. And, and his, his rule, his kingdom, his rule in our hearts that we are part of is an eternal one. It outlasts anything. It's stronger than anything. It outlasts any pandemic, any challenge, anything that we face in life. And so Nebuchadnezzar hears the dream, and, and how does he respond? He, he bows down in front of Daniel and just acknowledges that Daniel's God truly is the revealer of mysteries and is the one God who knows the future. And then as an act of thanks, he promotes Daniel to basically governor in Babylon and also allows Daniel to promote his friends. So Nebuchadnezzar, a very religious person. He needed to know that there is a God who is in control. Who, uh, that he needed to know that there is a God who is in control. We need to know that too. We all need to know that there's a God in control. We all need, we need that understanding or we won't be able to sleep at night. But we have an advantage over King Nebuchadnezzar. Now he might have had all the power and the glory and God speaking to him in dreams, but we have the perspective of being on the other side. We've seen the rock smash into the statue. We have the word of God. We have the rest of the story, the whole story. For us now, the, the hidden word has been made fully known. Friends, the word gives the understanding that you need. Jesus is the king of this forever kingdom. And his work on the cross and the empty tomb was the act that smashes all other power and authorities. Even the power that we let rule in our own hearts. Because don't we? Isn't that our problem? That we, that we want to be our own king? That we want to be our own ruler? And that, we have, that we let all kinds of things rule in our hearts? Isn't that our problem? We want to be in charge. We want to be successful. We want to be powerful. We want to be in control. We want to even be in control of the future. So what happens? What, how does that play out? We lie awake at night worrying about the future. In fact, right now, we, we even want to be in control of all things, even in the middle of a worldly pandemic, a worldwide pandemic. And so what happens? We lie awake at night, troubled and restless. 
But when that stone was rolled away on Easter morning, the stone smashed into that statue once and for all. He smashed our reliance on our, on our own strength. He smashed our reliance on our power. He smashed our reliance on earthly power. And he gave us something we could rely on. He gave us someone that we can always rely on. The word gives us the understanding we need. So, are we going to feed our fears? Or are we going to feed our faith? The, wor- the world feeds our fears, not our faith. The word, the word feeds our faith, not our fears. And when we feed our faith, just like that rock, it grows. So let's feed our faith, friends. Let, let's, let's be in the word. Let's look to Jesus. And, and then don't worry, because just like he did for Daniel, God will take care of the rest. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the assurance you give us in your word. Just let that peace and and rest fill the hearts of everyone listening today. That they may not, that all of us might not worry about the future, worry about what's going to even happen tomorrow, but just know that you are in charge, that you love us, you're in control, and that you have a beautiful future for all of us. Let that comfort each and every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen.